to my channel. In this video, we're talking about Rembrandt. I believe that Rembrandt's art can be a source of inspiration. I have been talking about Greeks and virtue, and today I decided to show how virtue looks. So Rembrandt and that type of art, in my opinion, can energize you and charge you. That's why I named this video as art therapy because it has therapeutic effects. Rembrandt gave everything he had up. He lost it all, his wealth, his home, his wife, in order to stay true to his art and his style. And his style was to show raw and honest human condition. And after watching this video, you will better have a better appreciation of his art and be able to use his pictures and paintings as, uh, as m motivational cards, I think. If you ever wake up tired and demotivated, you can pull up in your phone your favorite painting of Rembrandt, stare at it for two minutes, and bring these men and women back to life and understand that they had brutally long task lists uh, and crushingly big problems to handle that day. And rewards for all that troubles were huge then and will be huge today. In order to truly understand Rembrandt, we need to get in his world, his town, his cultural context. We need to understand Amsterdam. Amsterdam of 1600s is New York of the day. That's where most daring and most ambitious man wants to move. That's where Rembrandt moved, Miller's son from Leiden. That's where highest achievers live and biggest money is made. Ships are sailing in, unloading Chinese silk, Swedish iron and copper, and new mass market addictions, sugar and tobacco. So opportunities are there. But so is competition. These are, after all, Dutch. Rembrandt is trying to show specific types of virtues. Later, Max Weber, or in English, Weber, would call those Protestant virtues, or more broadly, virtues that pertain to Protestant ethic. Protestant ethic is a system of ethics which was inspired by Calvinist theology and practice. Calvinist theology emphasized several key virtues, hard work, prudence, frugality, modesty, industriousness, discipline. Weber thought that development of these virtues was instrumental to the economic rise of Protestant countries. He believed that these virtues gave them competitive advantage in economic affairs and was prime factor that explained economic superiority of Protestant countries compared to Catholic countries in Europe. So these virtues are what Rembrandt is trying to portray in his portraits. He's trying to show, express this in his subjects' faces, clothing, demeanor. Most extraordinary thing about these men and women that Rembrandt was painting was that they were not lords or ladies, not any type of nobility. In fact, these were people who came from extremely humble beginnings and made it or became as rich as it gets based on their hard work. But how do you outwork Protestants? How do you outwork Dutch that were Calvinist that lived in Amsterdam in 1600s. It wasn't easy. Amsterdam then was similar to runner's race or cycling race. After a certain amount of distances elapsed, every member of race and or cycling race or running race is exhausted and everybody is feeling physical pain in their heart, in their lungs, in their bodies. And it becomes in competition of endurance and toleration of pain. Whoever runs or cycles past the exhaustion and pain wins. Amsterdam was endurance race, and these men and women pushed human limits. So how could Rembrandt not show that? How could Rembrandt do what Velasquez was doing in Spain at the same time, who was 
practically photoshopping people that he was painting, making them look younger and prettier. But how could Rembrandt not show their stress wrinkles, their red eyelids, from all too often giving up good, good night's sleep for the sake of investors? How could he not show discolorations on their skins that showed that these people paid with their health to achieve success? These were not wrinkles. These were wounds of a hero. Like soldier takes pride in his scars because it shows who he is and where he has been. These people were their sacrifice like their badge of honor. By the time they were being painted, all the sacrifices were made. They paid their dues. Businesses were built. And now they're standing in front of a man who gets it all. Because Rembrandt is one of them. Rose from provincial nobody to cheekiest artist of the day. And he showed it all. He showed maybe not so flattering part of them, maybe a little bit ugly part of them. Maybe these people were not the most fun to hang out with. Maybe they were a little too serious. Maybe they took things to an extreme. And maybe they didn't have to take things to extreme. Maybe they were not just frugal, but miserly. Maybe they had to be that way in order to achieve that type of a unprecedented, unlikely success. Sometimes when you meet or study really successful people, you see that they have a side of them that's not so flattering, that they had to develop in order to reach that success. So Rembrandt shows it all, raw and honest, as always. Rembrandt also showed women who worked equally hard. Usually great men are created by great women. So these women would have to do so much work. They would have to get up earlier than their husbands to prepare everything and feed them. They, these were types of women whose households are running like clockwork. They have a lot of household chores and without modern appliances, they were brutally hard physical work. On top of that, they were primary educators and they were homeschooling their children. And they may or may not have had any type of help around the house because these are Dutch, these are frugal Dutch. And also in Spain and in Italy, women and wives of powerful and successful men were admired if they didn't do any type of work and they had soft fingers and they didn't do housework or any type of work. And in Holland, these women were admired because they did so much. And if you take a look at them, they look serene. They have peace about them. They look like they're rock solid. Somebody you can depend on. Somebody who's honest. Somebody who did right by her family. They look tired and worn out, but they have strength and regality about them. They have a look on their face that says, I led a life that was meaningful and worth living. It wasn't an easy life. You can tell they had hard lives but they did right things. Sacrifices were made, but they're proud of it. One last thing that Rembrandt has to do in order to be um, a greatest artist in Amsterdam, this is what everybody has to do, all artists, he has to paint corporate Amsterdam because Amsterdam is corporate town. It's not ruled from castles, it's ruled from boardrooms. And Rembrandt has to paint all these corporate man in one picture. This is how he goes about it in the beginning. But he's Rembrandt. He's trying to figure out something profound to say about these men, something worth saying and showing. So he comes up with this brilliant story, or rather a fairy tale, that these traders and textile men so wanted to believe in. It was pure romantic sentiment worth showing. These men, of course, are entrepreneurs. These are not military heroes. Somebody else is fighting ongoing war against Spain. But these men are part of militia. So they would like to think of themselves that if it was necessary, if Amsterdam ever needed them, they would be there to defend her freedom. But would they? Would they really? So Nightwatch is what Rembrandt produces and 
makes their boyish dream come true. And look at the lighting and even lighting, which shows power differential and complex pecking order among these basically toy soldiers. In front, you see a company of two men coming right at us. In black, Captain Franz Benincock, and to his left, Lieutenant Wilhelm van Rettenberg. Franz Benincock is hand gesturing military order to go forward, and his order is reflected on the costume of his left lieutenant. Night watch was the end of Rembrandt's glory days. These traders and entrepreneurs would have completely different type of children. Founding fathers and mothers of Holland were humble, modest, look how they're dressed, God-fearing, simple folks. But they were rich, very rich. So they would do what rich people always do. They sent their children abroad in France and Italy for education. They introduced them to arts and taught them how to play musical instruments. So these second generation kids were more cosmopolitan and they, when they would come back, they brought France and Italy with them. They dressed in silk, scarlet and purple. They wore rubies and pearls and a lot of lace and most expensive lace. So they brought about cultural change in Holland, drove Rembrandt out of business, out of home, out of neighborhood. Rembrandt was widowed and lost his home because he defaulted on his mortgage. Last 15 years of his life, he lived in extreme poverty, but he refused to meet the new demand of the second generation who wanted to be portrayed polished, showing, um, showing ease rather than hard work, and showing gloss and sophistication and elegance rather than roughness. So Rembrandt thought that that was not, that would not be true and representative of anybody's character. That was empty story, not worth telling. He took a huge personal sacrifice in order to be true to his art. And I believe that art that he produced and he left to us has power, a profound power to move, move us, to transform us, to make us better people, more noble. So I hope that I have sparked your interest and love of Rembrandt, that you will go and learn much more about him. There are a lot of documentaries. And next time you see him in museum, I hope that you will appreciate it and be filled with awe. So I hope that you enjoyed this video. I hope that I entertained you a little bit. So thank you so much for watching me and hearing what I have to say. And um, don't forget to subscribe to my channel. And yeah, thank you. <laughs> Bye.